Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week, Central Texas Gardener heads into a new season with exciting plants that stand up to drought and stand out in your garden. On tour, visit a makeover designed with more imagination than money. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. And also from The Planket, a plant covering designed to be lightweight, breathable, and water resistant to help keep plants warm and dry during harsh winter weather. Theplanket.com. You don't need a big bank account to have an outstanding garden. See how Paul Lofton does it on a budget. When Paul Lofton finds a good plant, he simply makes another to pass along or add to his garden. He isn't one to sit back and draw a plan. Paul makes decisions on the spot or when he runs into free stones that beckon his imagination. His children, John Vincent and Kimberly, added their touches. Kimberly designed the mosaic for her dad's foundling, repurposed plant stand. On his Facebook page, he chronicles his passion for plants, an evolution that's changed the yard that came with the house. We moved in here about 20 years ago, and when we moved in, this backyard here, the only thing that was in here was a pine tree in the backyard, and this ash tree. Uh, what's a lawn back here now was nothing but thousands of those sandburst stickers and stuff and then just over the years you know I started getting into gardening started creating a little space a little space and the plants I choose to use back here are just ones that are real low care maintenance because though I love gardening I don't like babysitting plants so they kind of like to have to survive me so I have a lot of folks come over here and go oh you must be back here all the time working and tending the plants actually he may be out in the garden but usually it's to carve out another spot as far as the pathways and stuff, I don't, a lot of people think I've sat down and planned this all out. I don't, I just kind of say, okay, I'm gonna do this. And it just, I'm like, okay, well, I'm doing here, let's make a walkway in here. And then later on, I'll say, okay, where can I join this to? It's a half acre lot, a lot of folks think it's a lot larger. And I try to have different seating areas because especially in the summertime, it's like, depending if you want to be out in the sun or in the shade, I've got different seating benches and areas and stuff like that where you can sit, eat. And, you know, depending on what time of day it is, there's always a spot to go sit in the shade if it's hot or if you want to sit in the sun. After removing grass, he doesn't plant right away. I do a lot of tilling. Uh, usually when I create a new garden area, it's one year from when I start killing off ground before I even plan on planting, because one of the most important things, and I think it's one of the reasons I had some success with the gardens, is I know how important soil preparation is. He adds his own compost, aerated with a PVC pipe, and tills in garden leaves. To supplement them on a budget, Paul fills scavenged tree pots with free compost and mulch from Pflugerville Recycling. Even in 2011's drought, his remaining lawn looks good. I spread like 15 of these like huge buckets of compost all over the lawn. And that's basically what I use as a fertilizer. Because some folks have been saying, how's your lawn green? I was like, oh, I haven't watered it in like three weeks. And it is St. Augustine, but just by putting the compost in there helps. And plus I stopped mowing it. I let it grow up to about six inches before I even mow it down again. Just conserve on water. In the rest of the garden, Paul keeps an eye out for plants that thrive on little attention. A lot of it's just trial and error, because I've also found sometimes you go to stores and they say, oh, the plant's zero escape and stuff, and you get, and it's not, it's mislabeled or something like that. So I usually give a plant what I call three strikes. I'll try it three times, three different places, and if it doesn't survive, it's just out of my garden. Drought tough plants that benefit wildlife have become a priority. 
I'm trying to make this more kind of like a little wildlife refuge. I've got friends all the time that just can't believe the amount of butterflies that'll be out here. I've seen an increase in like types of lizards that are here and stuff. And the population is just like really, really shot up over the years. Many times he goes shopping at home by propagating some of his favorites, often to share with fellow gardeners like Matt Jackson. One propagation technique is with recycled water bottles as many greenhouses. That's how I first started propagating because again, I read on it and I'm like, I'm not going to go out there and miss these things all the time and this and that too much. But I was like, oh, a little greenhouse if I set it up right. And depending where I have it, I just leave the cap on. And once I've cut it, put it in there, it's nothing. I ju it just sits there a couple of weeks. And if it's, you know, they start growing, you know it's rooted. And I go, yes. His daylily population exploded with help from his daughter. I've got probably about 50 to 60 named varieties. And me and my dog, one time I said, you know, so I started looking at pollination and took her out and I said, hey, let's cross pollinate some of these. And I just showed her how, you know, I'm not into all the scientific names and all that. I just enjoy gardening. So I just told her, it's like, here, take the one with the pollen, you hold this, sprinkle that on there. And then she goes, which ones? And I was like, well, you know, there, there's, there are dipods and tetrapods, something like that, and they have to meet the right thing. She goes, how do you know? I was like, who cares? Just take the thing, walk around. And she was like, Okay, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take this red daylily and blend it with, and I'm gonna do it on the purple one because the red and purple will look great. And I told her I was like, yeah, I said, but the thing, is, from what I understand, I said you'll have no idea of what it is. You could do a red and a purple, and it could come out pink or orange because it gets into genetics. And we just went around for a couple, you know, when they were in bloom because you had to do it early in the morning and stuff because they're daylilies. They only last the bloom lasts one day. We'd go out there in the morning, just kind of go out there, cross-pollinate a whole bunch. We had so many seeds, collected them, and, you know, I didn't keep track. You know, I'm not into, I just enjoy gardening. I'm not the scientific type. I didn't, you know, jot down which one's coming from which. But from that, I uh, planted the seeds, and I didn't realize almost every single one of them was going to grow. So currently now, uh, I don't have a full count yet, but I've got over 150 different varieties that, we actually hybridized just from the existing daylilies. His latest project in the works is a garden in honor of his wife Jody, who passed away in 2011. Pinks will join purple, her favorite color, like on the columbine hybrid she loved. I'm gonna actually go ahead and plant basically all purple, plus that she passed away from breast cancer after a six year battle. So I'm just gonna kinda make it all purple and pink. You know, the gardens are often the most meaningful places in people's lives, and I think we just saw a beautiful illustration of that. Thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. Right now, we're going to be turning our attention to some great plants that resist all kinds of tough conditions, whether we're talking about deer, drought, sun, you name it. These are plants that are going to work for you. I'm joined by Michael Kane from Vivero Growers uh, out in southwest Austin. Welcome to Central Texas Gardener. Thanks for having me. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Let's start off by talking about the nursery itself. Mm -hmm. uh, you're uh, located down in the southwest part of town off of 290. We're off of 290, about six miles past the Y and Oak Hill. Okay. There on the right side, out, right out by uh, Geo Grower Soil and some other nurseries there. Okay, so you're in good company. Yes. <laughs> which is great. You, people can shop around from place to place. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, let's talk about the what kinds of things you like to stock in the nursery. Uh, what we like to do... Uh, a lot of the staples, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have available the the Grow Green book mm -hmm. that put out by the city of Austin, and so of course we like to uh, uh, have a lot of those plants available mm -hmm. for for people. And then we like to do a lot of uh, kind of harder to find things and mm -hmm. uh, harder to find sizes, larger sizes. Well, you've brought some really cool things, and just from looking around at the the, the plants you've brought, it gives me a kind of a sense of the aesthetic and the taste that you have, and I love it because you've brought several of my all-time favorite plants oh, along, so good. I think we should just dive in and start talking about these plants. The first one we're going to talk about, and people who've watched the show for a long time know I'm crazy about agaves, 
This is my favorite form of agave. This is agave perii truncata, mm -hmm. which is uh, a, a West Texas native, I think. Yeah, and I also call it, call it a artichoke agave. Artichoke agave. It's a really nice and, one. And uh, looking at that form, you can understand why. Yeah, really nice, compact mm -hmm. form. Uh, nice for a, small, to, for a smaller agave. Right. And, you know, a lot of people are wary of agaves because they see these giant agave Americanas or something like that and that eat up people's right. backyards. Right. And Well, this is a nice small one, even, even for a container. Mm -hmm. What kind of situations do you like to tell your customers to use this plant? Uh, out in the hot sun. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, uh, the majority of the day, sun, mm -hmm. uh, well-drained soil. Right. Uh, otherwise, it's just a really tough plant. Yeah. Well, it's got a beautiful, beautiful form. I like to plant this f plant in masses for actually, oh. I like to see it planted in big groups, but it makes a great accent mm -hmm. too. And uh, you know, I think the one that you brought in is about as large as they get. <laughs> <laughs> it can get a little, little bigger, but yeah, we, <clears throat> we like to have some specimen size. Okay, so artichoke agave or agave perii truncata. truncata. Um, I, one of my all time favorites. Now, right next to it is a plant um, I don't recall talking about this before. It's Leonotis, mm -hmm. um, and it has a, a Monarda-looking kind of flower on it, but uh, it's not a Monarda. Tell me a little bit about this one. Uh, it's a, a really tough perennial. This mm -hmm. variety is called Savannah Sunset. Mm -hmm. uh, it can get pretty big, five, six feet uh, mm -hmm. by the same. Really? Uh, five or six feet, wow. Uh, again, full sun half mm -hmm. day at least mm -hmm. to keep it in bloom. It'll bloom just about all summer. Mm -hmm. You can cut it back uh, to keep it a little smaller, but yeah. uh, it's just got those really nice uh, kind of fuzzy orange blooms. Yeah. You know, a little different than the regular lion's tail. Leonotis, again, is the name, and uh, that color is fantastic. I, mean, I would, it's you know, really I like pretty. purple and orange together in the garden, and I could see this working really well with things like uh, Mexican bush sage or mealy blue sage, sure, things like that. Sure. It would really, that combination would be fantastic. It looks like a xeric plant. It's, it's pretty drought tolerant. Mm -hmm. It's pretty drought tolerant. Um, you know, it keeps that, that almost glossy green foliage mm -hmm. all summer, in the heat of the summer. You know, a little water to get it established, obviously, mm -hmm. but after that, it's just a really tough. How about the deer? The deer tend to not like it. It's got a real kind of citrusy smell to ah, it. Ah, good. So good. Um, we've had pretty good luck. Well, knock on wood right? <laughs> sure. when it comes to the deer. Yeah, that's right. So we have a couple of great choices there. Now, uh, the next plant we have is one that is a kind of a giant form of an old favorite. It's Jerusalem uh, sage. And uh, this is, uh, I, I'm, I don't know if I've seen this large leaf form before. So this is a, a, just a large leaf form of the Jerusalem sage. Mm -hmm. it, it gets uh, about three feet tall mm -hmm. um, with the blooms. Uh, the foliage stays a little smaller than the regular Jerusalem sage. A larger leaf, but smaller in, in overall size. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just as tough, just as drought tolerant. Uh, Again, full, full to part sun, mm -hmm. at least half a day. This is a plant that just will hang on for years in, in extremely tough circumstances. Oh, yeah. And I know that because I planted it in my current garden like 14 years ago, <laughs> left for 12 years. Nobody took care of it in the interim. Now I'm back. There it is. And it's still there. <laughs> so well, it's, great. It, it's a survivor for sure. And uh, it, I love the nice bright yellow flower mm -hmm. on that one. So Jerusalem sage, a great plant for people to be using. And you've brought in, a, I mentioned Mexican bush sage a little while ago, you brought in a kind of white pink flowered variety that um, I've never seen this one before either. Yeah, so this is a, a, just a salvia leucantha Mexican bush sage. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got the white and pink blooms. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, it tends to bloom all summer mm -hmm. for us. Uh, we had it planted out in, uh, in our planters last summer and it just bloomed and bloomed. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a little smaller. It tends That's to be a actually smaller. a good thing. Yeah. yeah, but it's just a really neat, um, different bloom. Well, it, it's you know that cool color during mm -hmm. the summertime, mm -hmm. very refreshing. Sure. And uh, absolutely love kind of the the pastel like quality mm -hmm. of it. Uh, I, I think this is a real keeper. I, I really, really like the color on it. And again, for a proven performance area, it's hard to beat. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I, I, this is one you can, once you get it established, we'll come back reliably year after year after right, year. Right, right. Now, be, behind that, we have yet another form of agave, and uh, that it, this is the, what we call the whale's tongue agave. I forget what the botanical name on this one is, but uh, that, I, I like to think that it would be a killer whale's tongue because <laughs> <laughs> that looks pretty well armed. <laughs> well, that's a really nice one. It, uh, it, it's a smaller agave, it, about mm -hmm. four feet, mm -hmm. four, four to... Bigger than the trunk peri right. for sure. But also a really wide leaf, mm -hmm. so whale's tongue. Well, it's it's a, I love it. I love the the dark thorns or barbs on the sides of the on the plant and the way that it imprints. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that uh, the agaves are known for. And on this one, it can be really striking. Sure. And uh, it's been a really popular. Agave. Oh yeah, yeah, a great centerpiece for or an anchor plant for a perennial bed or a, you know a rock garden or something like that. Sure. Yeah, so uh, some definitely one for people to, to be on the lookout for. You, you've been hitting home runs with me on the plants you brought <laughs> in because you you know in, in addition to the perii, which is one of my all-time favorites, you brought in uh, dianthus, and I've been crazy about these plants for the longest time, and the great blooms. And then this incredible foliage, which is so tidy and mm. bright and, and tight. Most people would like it just for the foliage. Yeah, it, yeah. That, just that really nice, compact mm -hmm. uh, trailing. You know, just yeah. little, little pin cushions. Mm -hmm. Pin cushion is a good way to describe it. I have some of this in a blue ceramic pot that's tall and narrow, and it's just kind of slowly creeping down the side of that pot. Wow. The contrast between the kind of the gray foliage and the blue is just really striking and. Uh, you know, I, I, and I think this is a very xeric plant. It is. It, it holds up. It holds mm -hmm. up. Uh, even in the nursery, we we barely water it. Well, and I think that's the key to success with this plant, don't you? I mean, it, it does need a, a well-drained soil. Yeah. It, it does need a well-drained soil. Um, it doesn't want to stay too, you know, too wet. Mm -hmm. Wet feet. You um, know, even even in a container, I usually turn in a significant percentage of granite soil sand just when, for some I'm, extra when, I'm, when I'm when I'm planting this one. Sure because I really think it helps. But this one is Bath's Pink, right? Bath's Pink. Right. And, uh, and, it, and it can trail out you know, a, a couple feet or, or mm -hmm. more, uh, like you said, in your container. Right. It sounds like it's getting pretty, pretty long. Yeah. <laughs> well, real briefly, you also brought in some beautiful Echeveria. And this, again, these are just uh, uh, striking plants that are, are easy for in the ground or in containers. Right. And, and this, is, this one in particular just really holds up. Uh, some of them can be a little finicky. This one is just, it takes the heat, it takes quite a bit of cold, um, and it, it's not fussy about too much water, mm -hmm. you know, if it gets a little bit of water, uh, or none at all. All right. So. Well, we only have a few seconds left, so again, we want to remind people about the name of the nursery is Vivero's Growers Nursery. Vivero Growers Nursery. And uh, again, the location. And we're at uh, 12,290 West, which is about uh, six miles past the Wyan Oak Hill. Look off to the out. right if you're heading out of town? It will be on the right-hand side. Okay. All right. All right. Next to Geo Growers in that area. Just before that. That's well, right. Well, we really appreciate you coming on board. Good luck to you and the whole team out of Vivero Nursery, and uh, we look forward to having you back Great. sometime. Well, thank you. All right. Thank and you. coming up next, it's our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is Augie, CTG's resident doggy horticulturist. Our question this week comes from Larry. He sent in this picture for advice about his oak tree. We consulted arborist Guy LeBlanc, who confirmed what we thought. This is crown gall. Guy says it's usually caused by a bacterium, but some experts say other causes are possible. The source of entry is usually some kind of wound, oftentimes nematodes or other insects that invade the roots. Some galls that occur low on a trunk can actually be fungal galls. Guy also confirms that the white insects in the picture are termites. He's often seen them infest crown galls, but says that they won't harm the living portion of the tree as our local termites just invade the dead tissue. Guy is consulted with entomologists who do not recommend treating the termites. Guy concludes by telling us that most trees that he's seen with crown gall survive in very good condition without treatment. But he's also seen some that slowly decline over many years. And unfortunately, there's no successful treatment for crown gall that he knows of. So our advice to Larry is to keep the tree healthy, well watered, correctly pruned, and to avoid damaging the bark. Thanks, Larry and Guy. Our pick of the week is Thryalis, Galfimia glauca. 
This drought top shrub needs very little water to be happy, making it a great choice if you need to replace any shrubs that you might have lost to last year's drought. It gets about four to six feet tall and about four feet wide, so give it plenty of room to spread. It prefers to be in full sun, but can take part shade. Thryalis also tolerates any soil type, but does need good drainage. So if you have heavy clay soil, be sure to amend it or replace it with a sandy loam topsoil. And be careful not to overwater. Thryalis is covered in yellow flowers from spring all the way till frost, and the leaves are a nice, dark, glossy green. The leaves are small, giving the plant a bit of wispiness and a light breeze. It's listed as deer resistant, a big plus for Central Texas landscapes. Thryalis is listed hardy to only about 25 degrees Fahrenheit, making it a little susceptible to freeze damage. But even when temperatures drop below 25, it's normally root hardy and will bounce back in the spring. If the plant is freeze damaged, simply prune it back and let the new growth take over. Thryalis may also get overly leggy. If that happens, you can either train it to have a more tree-like shape or prune back the entire plant to encourage it to recover its bushiness. To do this week, it's finally time to plant vegetables. Although I know many of you have been unable to resist the urge and have had your transplants in for weeks already, it's now time to plant eggplant, peppers, tomatoes, tomatillos, summer squash, beans, cantaloupe, and all our other great warm season vegetables. You could also plant any perennial flowers that you'd like. And it's a great time to plant those spring blooming perennials. Right now in the nursery, you'll see lots of beautiful columbine, gilardia, coreopsis, blackfoot daisy, and coneflower. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your question or plant of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Meredith Giles for Backyard Basics. Howdy, friends. Meredith Giles here with Backyard Basics. And today we're going to talk about propagation, or more specifically, taking cuttings or cloning. Now, like any good project, there's a few questions you want to ask up front. First of all, what type of plant are you wanting to propagate? Is this an herbaceous plant, a woody plant, a succulent? Is this a plant that's easy or difficult to propagate? If you're not sure, ask at your local independent garden center. Another question is, how many plants do I want to make? You always want to start more cuttings than you want at the end, because you may not have all of them survive. Finally, what kind of investment are you willing to make? How important is it that you get these plants? So there's several different methods of cloning. One of the easiest ones is doing cuttings in water. This is really simple and cheap. Start with a clean vial of water, and then we're going to take a little plant like this basil here, we're going to remove a few of the leaves at the base, exposing a node, and then we're simply going to stick this straight in water. Now these plants will start to produce some roots in the water, but the roots that they make in the water are different than the soil roots. So as soon as you start to see roots emerge, you want to get them into some soil. Here I have a little ivy plant that I started about three weeks ago, and we see it has some nice new roots starting to come out. So we want to take this guy and just put him straight in some potting soil. Easy as cake. Now succulent plants are generally pretty easy to propagate. Here we have a little burrow's tail sedum. This guy could simply be placed right on top of the soil like that. It will actually put out roots, root right down into the soil. Also, here we have a jade plant. I've removed a few leaves, again exposing the nodes, and we're just going to stick this straight in soil. Piece of cake and it'll root very quickly. Now for something that might be a little more difficult, say a woody plant, uh, we want to use something to really encourage it to go. Rooting powder is a great way. Rooting powder has an antifungal and hormones to help induce root growth. So we're going to take this little ficus cutting. We want to mist him down with some water to get him nice and wet. Then we're just going to take him, dip him in our rooting powder. You see we've got nice coverage of the powder there, and then we'll stick this in soil. Now on some plants that have large leaves such as this, you may want to remove some of the leaf surface so that it doesn't drink too much moisture. So we can just simply cut the leaf right in half. Now similar to rooting powder is cloning gel. It's kind of the next step up. This is going to be your highest investment, but this is what professionals use. So we've got this cutting here. We're going to take this rooting gel and dip him in there. This gel is very thick and viscous and sticks really well to the cutting. 
Now also, we're, and put, instead of putting this one in soil, we're actually going to use a product called rock wool. This is another thing that professionals use for propagation. We'll stick our cutting right in. It'll hold him right in place. And then we can actually just put water right in this tray and it will suck it right up. You want to keep your cuttings moist, but not too wet, and try to keep them warm. Also, try to avoid too much direct sun, but give them good light. Another little trick, one of the best ways to water cuttings is to use something like a mist bottle. This way you can deliver good moisture to the plant, but you're not giving it too much water at one time to wash the soil around and move it around too much. Also, don't rush yourself. Cuttings can take up to a month to really get started. This is Meredith Giles with Propagation Backyard Basics. Visit klru.org slash cdg to find out more and watch online. Next week, join Lauren and Scott Ogden, authors of Waterwise Plans for Sustainable Gardens. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. And also from The Planket, a plant covering designed to be lightweight, breathable, and water resistant to help keep plants warm and dry during harsh winter weather. Theplanket.com.